Hello and welcome to the first uh, Business Jam Live for a week or two. Well, a Business Jam Live with live guests, that is. So, uh, nice. Well, I'll say it, nice to see you, but I can't see who's out there. But if you have any questions or comments, you can, uh, whether you're on YouTube, um, Facebook or LinkedIn, please put your comments there and I can see them and we'll take them on board. Or if they're questions... We'll try to answer them. So it's probably time to introduce our guest because he'll be champing at the bit, I'm sure. So my guest today, who is he? Well, he created the Idea Factory. Um, if you're on LinkedIn, you may very well have seen that. He created the Idea Factory to help people and organizations uh, develop and grow their innovation skills and their innovation capacity in order to get, obviously, in innovative results. Uh, if you search for him, you will find many books, hundreds of articles, and he is also the uh, creator stroke inventor of the Navigator Guides, which have sold over 60,000 copies, which is quite a lot, I'm sure you agree. He's now based in Canada, but he's gone there via New Zealand and, and Australia. So, please welcome today's guest, Ed Bernacki. Hello, Ed. Well, hello, Derek. Thanks very much. Yeah, I'll, I'll just before we start, we just I ought to have mentioned the audio issue. If anybody says that there are any audio issues with volume or whatever, please do let us know, and we can do something about it. We can knock off early and do it again, or enhance the audio for for next week's replay so anyway ed here we are finally well, thank so you. how how did you get to doing what you're doing oh wow um i think i was always the idea guy right from my very very first job i didn't really understand it there i could look at almost anything so working at a non-profit you know, in Canada, actually, with the Sports Association, the Soccer Association. And that was my first degree, was actually in sports management. And I loved it, this whole on-field thing. We weren't running programs. But I was just really good at coming up with new for, you know, this is the way we did it last year. Well, how about we do it next year like this? I think just over a number of years, I realized I was really good at this. But then you start realizing that you're kind of on the outside of things, you know, like sometimes the person with the ideas is it's not always appreciated. You know, you can um, you can upset people by coming up with new and better ways to do it when you forget that they may have come up with the old way. So that all kind of led into me deciding to go back to university. And I, that's how I thought there was an executive MBA program. I decided to go there for a whole new experience. But I focused then quite a bit on service innovation. I really had no, no particular interest in product development, but I was really interested in, in how service organizations, right from the nonprofit world to the professional services, because I also spent a few years working with um, KPMG in Canada. And then the nonprofit, sorry, the public service, um, I ended up then working with New Zealand Post in very much what we probably call today an innovation team, but we just didn't use that language. And it was all to do with finding improvements to internal services and external services. So that kind of, a, that kind of this, this, this overview kind of started to realize that this ability to come up with new ideas whenever we need them and wherever we need them, I just thought all organizations need to do that. But I'm not sure they know how to do that. And that's kind of what started my whole process around but that all organizations need to be an idea factory so i started doing a lot of research a lot of kind of writing about this studying of all kinds of aspects of it and i think that kind of developed this, this kind of expertise i developed um, working in different countries but it was much driven on um, i think my, my real interest is, is to build the skills and capacity of people to be more innovative in their thinking and their work their results you know what what skills are needed uh, what perspective needed um how do how do we harness different styles of thinking like we know people don't think alike 
how do we use that diversity? So I sort of, I'm kind of, it's a long story, Lord, all these different areas of this work. So does that, that give some background? I, th I think I, I think that's more than enough. And you've quite cleverly touched on some of the things that we said we'd talk about today. The first one is one, one of the words in the title, innov innovationalism, which is, you know, you, you mentioned the fact that um, being being the one who comes up with the ideas can make you unpopular, but you have to sometimes say the things that need to be said. And yeah. and I, I have I haven't thought about that before to, to, until you uh, mentioned that the uh, the other the other day that uh, yeah you, in like any other sort of ism whether it's socialism or any sort of fundamentalism that the people who are advocating this are in fact speaking out and hence potentially unpopular yeah well i think the, the, this notion of um being an innovationalist i have to say i was kind of inspired by david suzuki I mean, quite a famous canadian environmentalist he's not liked by a lot of people other people just love what he does and that that, that kind of got me thinking about that innovation needs the same kind of roles someone who will stand up and, and, and say some things that may not, be, this work is just mediocre. Like we can do better than this. Like that's not a good message, but also no. to kind of be a role model, you know, to kind of, to, to kind of walk the talk. I, how do I say this nicely? I think there's a lot of people talk about innovation thinking that's what makes them innovative. Okay. Mm, it's what you yeah. do that makes you innovate. Um, yeah. And, this notion about being a role model, you know, it's it, part of it is um, I think kind of the work on problem solving. I, I read a number of articles that said, well, you can't solve a problem to be a problem worth solving. And I've always mm. thought that the, um, the people who are good at this work, in fact, aren't just good problem solvers. They're actually good problem finders. They can look at something everybody else has looked at and go, we could probably do this now. So, and I think that the third part of that was that kind of enrolling people that into this notion that all of us can be kind of more innovative and we can we can kind of create our own solutions whenever and we need them, you know, no matter what, what kind of challenges we're facing, that we can be kind of a, you know, this capacity to innovate to all kinds of things. And I think the, um, you know, for anybody else who's trying to explore this idea, looking at how, say, environmentalists, do their thing i think it's actually a quite a good it, it's, it's, there's so many parallels i mean in fact that's one of the creativity techniques that you can use is you know, steal insights and ideas from one world and bring them into this one that i think that's one of the things that that, that the innovation work needs is is like to be Oh, well, to anybody listening, it would appear that we've uh, lost Ed's network connection. So hopefully, um, hopefully he'll manage to uh, he'll manage to get it uh, get it back. It's saying on my little dashboard here that uh, his network connection has gone. So ho hopefully he'll come back very shortly. But that is an interesting point as to what Ed was Ed was saying about the fact that. Hello, Ed. I was just explaining that you disappeared. Okay, because I um, I'm not sure if that's at my end or there's some technical issues here. Um, it's somewhere between you and the okay. uh, restream Sorry. server. So, uh, yeah. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm I'm not. I think I think you probably got most of that message. In in indeed. Um, I was I was just actually thinking about the um the the importing stuff from elsewhere. Um. There's a there's a very fine line between there's what 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 we in our MBA course used to call creative swiping, which is it's okay to pinch stuff from elsewhere, to what some people, and I hate to hate to say this because one or two people could be listening who are doing it, 
a lot of um, particularly academic institutions, but some other companies are just copying it and calling it innovation. They're not innovating. Oh, yeah. They're just they're, they're they're just copying. But if you yeah. if you cherry pick the good stuff and combine it with other stuff and do something, uh, then 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 why not? Yeah. Well, they're just linked to what you've said. There is a technique that I've often used called parallel worlds. Um, and it's in some of the creativity book. It's actually doing what you're suggesting, but in, in a proper way. Um, I've used this with a whole lot of groups where you look at a domain where your problem is. I, I, I'll give you, just to make some sense of this, I was, I was working with a and they produce really cool tents, backpacks, and then the seat. So his vision is to inspire people in wilderness. And he need, so the, the technique is um, they wanted to inspire and kind of educate people. So we kind of looked and said, well, what other worlds try to inspire and educate world people? Hmm. And we just made a whole list. And then we picked one, just early, which was religion. Religion tries to inform and inspire. And then the simple technique was, well, how does religion do that? You know, there was disciples, there's a Bible, there's a church, there's ritual. So the whole technique was, well, what's the equivalent of the Bible for a backpacking company? So, of course, it's mm -hmm. not about the Bible. It's about, so we kind of created, they could actually market kind of journals that people could take into the wilderness. There could be some poetry or tips in that that could be designed to fit in special yeah. pockets in their coats you see what i'm getting at here the disciples yeah. suddenly became who could be the yeah. disciples I mean, to spread the word and all of a yeah. sudden they had they thought of the whole speakers program not to sell equipment but to sell the idea of being inspired in the wilderness yeah well, that's all you that, need yeah so you see what i get but as a, as a technique and then you just arbitrarily go through all of them. No, 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 they're not all going to be good ideas. You can take lessons yeah. how problems were solved in one world and bring it over. But you have to recreate it. That's the thing. Yeah. But that's, yeah, that's that kind technique. of discipline of the techniques, which I think actually is you need that discipline to kind of force a new connection, yeah. um, which is very different to just copying something. Indeed, because well, co well, with copying, you lose the context, which is which, which is everything. Um, the other thing that goes quite nicely with that, I've found, is um, I don't know if you come across a t technique. Uh, Why well, I, I learnt it as working with aliens. So you, whatever problem you have, you you're effectively showing it to aliens, and the aliens have no idea. You know, they've yeah. just arrived in their spaceship. They don't know that this thing with four legs is a table. They want to know what it does. Why it's what it's made of? Why you know? And that's quite nice for stripping away the rubbish and get getting getting to the fundamentals. So oh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, there's hundreds there's hundreds of these things. Yeah. Well, that what I think what you what you've expressed there is I have not heard that one, but that's actually a good setup for it. But it, it's looking at um, a problem, and then I, I often used to use the language around identifying the implicit assumptions here. Like, what did we once assume about this that we've now forgotten about? Um, mm. And I'll, I'll tell you a, a kind of a crazy thing. When I first moved to New Zealand, I had never seen a dual toilet in Canada. Do you know, do you know what I'm talking about here? Yeah. Where, yeah. Okay, kind of gross, but I'd never seen one. And I thought, oh, my God, I just thought, how interesting that how they solve the problem of how do you flush a toilet? Because one yeah. of the implicit assumptions, I guess most of North America was each flush has to be the same amount of water. And if mm -hmm. you actually think about that, you go, well, actually, no, it doesn't have to be. Yeah. I just thought, but I'll tell you what, it's kind of a gross story, but people never forget it if you tell it to them. Um, no, in, in, indeed, very, and of course, the modern thing you can use that one. The modern but equivalent will be ba will be based on artificial intelligence and goodness knows what else. Yeah. Yeah. But well, it, but it'd be it, complete it, overkill. Yeah, it was just one where um, this notion of asking all those kind of naive questions to actually uncover yeah. the, the assumptions that we forgot about. 
um, I almost in any context, that's a really good way to start like exploration of, of an issue. Like, so before you start to solve a problem, it's actually a good way to really explore what the problem might be. Yeah. So, but anyways, that's, that's most interesting. The alien story. Yeah, well, there you go. If you're listening, folks, you've learned at least two things here today already. So that that's quite good. But yeah, I was just just think, thinking just very briefly before we move on about your, the the innovationalism, and I, I was sort of linking linking that to: Do we actually need somewhere? I I'm not sure if we need them inside companies, but inside society somewhere, fundamentalist innovationalists. A sort of innovationist jihad in in some sort of way. Yeah. You know, that's a really interesting idea. Um, for, it's actually, you know, it's fun. I've been thinking about things like this before. For our importance, like that we know that we have to keep solving problems in better and more sophisticated ways because our challenges are getting bigger. I've always said there should be this kind of, um, I don't know, government funded, private sector, whatever kind of a capacity that actually looks at how do we improve the quality of collaboration, cross organizing, problem solving, the whole, all these tools. What should I know? Like something mm -hmm. where this like real hard research is happening. Now, I mean, just to simplify all this, if you, I mean, I, almost as an experiment, I opened up a 1980s Harvard Business Review. But how many of these topics are completely relevant today? And there was one on how to design good things. You think after 40 years, we would have figured out how to organize really effective meetings. You know, that, that's where collaboration is supposed to happen. And, yeah. and, and it's as if that we haven't really found a way to have an idea or a process in 1940. We use it in the 50s, it grows. We use it, we use it. It's like we forget all this uh, initial work that happened. Um, just, you would have, we, I think we may have talked about this, some of the early work by Alex Bourne in the 1950s when he wrote his book that, that kind of articulated brainstorming. I really wanted to understand that original context. And when I read his book, I realized that it's a 300 page book. He doesn't even introduce brainstorming as kind of a group technique until page 280. The first, you know, 279 pages were effectively how to think more creatively to solve problems, offering all kinds of processes, insights. I had no idea. Because all I ever knew about brainstorming was something about, you know, getting to and coming up with ideas. A lot of his, he would have said in, in the 50s that you brainstorm with people once they have these, you know, they access these tools and they had a process involved. We sort of lost a lot of those ideas. Or then, you know, and then 20 years later, we keep reinventing them. So I'll go back to your whole story about a play where this kind of research happens, I, I think that is really interesting. Um, to kind of, I know that there's different groups like in, in the UK, Nesta. I mean, I think they yeah. do like that. Um, but, but I think that's a, I think it's a really brilliant idea. And I've also wondered how we could make it normal that all organizations, whether you're a profit or your public service or private sector, how you would have, like, make it normal to have something like an innovation strategy. So we have HR, yeah. we have marketing, we have that. Now, a lot of organizations do, but how do we make that a normal thing to, one, build the skills staff to be innovative, to really studying where to focus those skills to be able to kind of produce organizational results. Some could be improving internal services and some could be on new product sources. I'd like to hope soon that that, that notion of ha having someone who handles that role would be just 
as normal as having a training manager, an HR manager, you know, this, I don't know what your experiences are like that. Yeah, I, 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 there are people who, who have those names, but they're not maybe doing what we think they should do. Yeah. But I, 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 I do wonder if this, if it should sort of be not quite split into two, but divided because there's, there's the things that companies and organizations need to do every day. Yeah. And then there's the stuff where people need to learn about, they need to develop brand new stuff, ways of thinking that haven't even been thought about, which will be uh, expensive for organizations. To, and this is, this is what universities would say they should be doing, but they're interested in publishing papers and doing, and doing research to earn, earn money. Um, so, I mean, I know, I, I don't know, you, you probably have them, innovation centers of excellence and things like that, which yep. a little bit iffy because some of them just turn into sort of um, business incubators. But um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've just got this vision in my head, maybe of a nice big pyramid building somewhere where innovation stuff happens but people from all over the world or Europe or America or whatever can just turn up and immerse themselves in it and go away and take it back. And it would be a lot, it would be a lot cheaper, be a lot cheaper for the companies. They could, they could effectively come together, learn the tools and then go away and use the tools. So they yeah. wouldn't actually be having to give away secrets. Um, yeah, that's right. When, it, when you're talking about using the best tools, you still have to use them to create value. You know, this is like the mechanics, yeah, tools, the, the whoever's tools that, that they're, that doesn't mean that they're going to do, if you're a great mechanic, you need tools, that you still need skills to use those tools. Indeed. I love this idea. And I totally want the, um, this notion of like two levels. Cause I think it would work. I think it very much works at that level. Um, this, this, um, this kind of pure, let's call it the pure innovation, rethinking core models, the big things, reinventing both yeah. how we collaborate and reinventing systems and services for the future. Like this is around, you know, taking a term look to see that our problems are probably going to be more complex in the future. The other half around mm -hmm. this, how do we develop the capacity of our organizations to solve Indeed. more, more difficult challenges. And that is, um, now th th there's, there's so many, I mean, there's so many links to this. Now, one area that if you do look at, I mean, I've spent a lot of time working in governments in public service in, in US, there is the OECD observatory of public service innovation. And they are in some ways trying to do what, what you've said across public service they do studies they, they 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 champion kind of a lot of ways of like new models of thinking um people are encouraged to you know contribute from estonia and all, all, yeah. I mean, virtually you, you name the country they're part of it because governments around the world have been kind of working on innovation projects for for at least 25 years and i'm um south africa has center for public service innovation from about 2000 in five, um, Singapore. I was involved in some projects to launch uh, an innovation skills kind of skills and capacity building program. That was 2002. So, so some of this has been a long time. But again, it, it's in terms of the public service, they're trying to create resources that countries can just learn from, so they don't have to start from the beginning. Now, kind of moving to your point. You can easily see that model for nonprofits and associations. You know, slightly different issue, service sector. But this other one, you know, how do we make the corporates, corporations, and companies kind of more innovative? But in, in a, it's not just about inventing new products to sell more. But they've also, you know, th th there's a role that our corporate sector has to, to meet to kind of the future challenges. You know, global warming. How do we produce products that have less garbage? You know, I'd like mm -hmm. the, the, all these kinds of things. But I love this idea, though. Of, of um, well, let me just summarize: is that I think it was maybe twenty years ago or something. I read a, a paper by Henley and Price Cooper's on a, a 
they're seeking an idea to understand what makes innovative organizations innovative. Do you think by now we could answer that question definitively? I should be reading the articles that have kind of definitive, here's mm. the 10 things that, 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 that have been thoroughly researched in all sectors, but this is what organizations need to be more innovative. I haven't just done a research, you know? Um, I, and I didn't want that could be one of the products of this model that you're talking about. Indeed. That's something what we, that what just, we need to do. Sorry, carry on. No, I was going to say, this. you also need part of that job would be to deconstruct and debunk some of the um, mm. some of the quasi research. Like, uh, I mean, I've, I've seen consulting groups do research on innovation. And then you kind of, you, you, you dig down into who did you sample and you realize it's their clients that they interviewed. Yeah. Well, their clients aren't a sample of, you can't make generalizations from people who are paying you to do work for them. Or some of the um, papers when you realize that something to do with behavior for innovation or creativity, they're not testing managers and, and staff and businesses they're testing students hmm. and making a sense that it would be this so it's things like that, that, that i think that need we need to kind of distill some of this to be able to to surprise to what what actually happens like, like i'm just leaving this, this all kind of ended with this thought but the one thing that did impress me study 20 years ago was when they it's how they pick their sample study and interested in what industry you're in, they just looked at the Times 1000 list and they just ranked them. They did, so they, they looked at 300 companies and they ranked them on one factor, which was how much of your revs come from products and services that you kind of invented over the past five years. So that was kind of thought of as, a, as an, in, like an indicator. Yeah. We saw a need, we did something to fill that need, it worked. And we profited by doing that. Now, that was a really interesting way to do it. Um, very, very few studies I've ever seen in this space you kind of qualify people to be studied. Um, yeah. The, you know, linking to this, I once, I once expressed this by if you're trying to um, understand fitness, how people get fit, if you ask Olympic athletes, their answer is going to be very different to somebody who walked their dog for 20 minutes a night. Now, both may think they're getting fit, but the difference in the, in the, in the kind of the recommendations will be enormous. How do you distinguish in, in, the, in the business sense, the Olympic company that does innovation versus the a company that does some brainstorming session, they, you know, they have some posters on the wall. See, see what I'm getting at here? Yeah. But it's really yeah. hard to qualify. But I, no, I think I, that if they could do that, it'd be absolutely brilliant. Yeah. What, what, we, what we actually need is, to, uh, I, I don't know if you come across my metaphor, but I have a metaphor. Um, Colin, he, Colin the chameleon, he's, uh, which I use in some of my presentations. So the, the, the idea being that an organization needs to be chameleon-like. It should be able to change in advance of things happening automatically yeah. without HR. You know, these, so, uh, yeah, I, studying Colin's behavior is probably the thing. I think what we should actually do, if we mentioned the word jihad and finance together online enough times, then somebody in one of the security <laughs> agencies will, will pick it up and wonder what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Well, might get us into might get us into trouble. Yeah, but the, uh, this yeah, there we... of innovationalists. It, someone else told me, um, gave me kind of another analogy for that. It's like being the court jester. You know, the person that kind of goes, "Okay, boss, you you say you're the boss, but are you actually seeing what's happening here? Mm. That they have that they have they've earned the right." to poke at things, if you know, if that makes some sense. Yeah. Um, to say that you don't say things that are unimportant. Um, no, when I, that, I just, I mean, I've had a couple of situations where I've had, I, 
I, I, one boss in particular who he's one of those people who's you know he, he sound, sounded really good came we met us he was our director when i was in his marketing group he said my door is always open to your ideas I'm not sure they're actually expecting people to actually knock on the door no but i did have a concept and i had to go i was i was still in finishing ba at the time and this was like a, an intern project i was doing then and in the market, no one was interested. So I just had nothing to lose. So I, I knocked on his door and I said, you know, you mentioned once about you could come in and spend five minutes to talk about an idea. And I think he was so shocked that someone did it that he, he just said, okay. Well, we ended up talking for an hour and a half about a con I had that it was quite different. And he just was so intrigued by it that he actually pulled out a checkbook and said, Here's a couple, I'm going to write, you know, he basically wrote me a check for a couple thousand dollars because he wanted me to, when I went back to university, take that idea and give him three or four pages of notes on it that he wanted mm -hmm. to file it. And he was one of those, I think one of those really rare people that actually did everything right. You know, he was very open to new ideas and he actually really liked stuff come to him with sort of half ideas because he can build on that and he said very specifically that he's not, he doesn't like this when staff would come to him with a you know the concept all written up all ready to go because it's he says it's too late to have any input on that and i yeah. just thought that was really interesting so yeah um but well, getting back to the original point that there's so many insights that i think have been learned over the past few years that i just I hate the thought that that could get lost. You yeah. know, I'm seeing this shift now towards everything's now. 20 years ago, we talked about creative thinking, and then now we're talking about design thinking. Pretty much the same concepts. It's the same thing, but somebody's making money out of publishing the materials and the model. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where um, I think I get, I get really kind of concerned about um, that instead of building this kind of innovation toolkit, we're not doing that. Um, you, you might, I mean, in particular, like a certain segment of this work, I first was introduced to the, uh, the Russian tech, Triz. Yeah. Okay, that is a highly specific thing. And I was, I went to some webs and I thought, you know, this is the kind of tool case that should be standard for engineering it's it's brilliant um and I've, I've seen it used i don't use it a lot. i've never i don't know it well enough to use it but as a toolkit in this kind of big innovations sort of suitcase or whatever i hope it doesn't get lost because there's just too much value to be had there um the work on even like saying edward de bono his six thinking hats poe all these books very few people know about this work. And really? I, 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 hope, I hope that there's, you know, that there's some a future study of this. You know, you, you also taught in a university. I taught in a master's of innovation program in Australia. It also occurred to me that every commerce and management degree should have what's called innovation. Well, um, not just not just that. I think, think every degree, I mean, every... Uh, all engineers, um, everybody should yeah. should have you know, something because I mean I don't know what sort of buildings you have in Canada, but we're suffering now. Well, I use the word suffering literally from these um, grey steel structures, that, well grey steel skeletons with cladding put on them, yeah. and that's it. Mm -hmm. And then when you when you look at the um, the city of London, we got some, you know, wonderful buildings, the Gherkin building, there's one that looks like a telephone handset, yeah. the Shard, without that sort of thinking, those buildings would never ever have been created. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, you know what, I totally agree. The, the course that I was part of in Australia, this is at the University of Adelaide, the students were mostly, it was a, it was a, it was a math graduate level course. The students were either engineers, different kinds of engineering or projects management and part of the masters of innovation was some of it product development my end was more the internal building 
creative organization. But even even I, I'm you've, you've actually got me thinking about this. I absolutely would agree that even a basic introduction to some of these concepts about create problem solving, you know, so I'm right at the beginning, you know, problem solving, collaboration um, could be really useful for in, in, in all programs. As we, you know, I mean, yeah. If you taught them, if you taught them at a, found, a sort of foundation level, yep. then it would all, all the students could actually use that in all of their assignments as well. Uh, I was just about to say what you just said. I I was approached by a group of students. There was quite a few Chinese and Asian students in that class, and a number of them came up to me and said, "But you don't know that we're using a lot of your lessons in our other classes." And I wasn't sure where what he was talking about to start, but he said like you, you taught us how to brainstorm like an idea factory, and well, we're given problems to work on in our other classes and assignments, but they don't teach us how to collaborate. You know, yeah. we just get an assignment, and so he used this thing about like I, a whole thing I did on collaboration. You know, working with people who don't think like you. Um, when you have a group of people who have to generate ideas, think like an idea factory. I gave him some techniques. I was completely thrilled when he said that, that they could see application right away to the work. Um, one, one woman, she was um, an, a kind of a highly structured analytical engineer. She said that when we, she remembered something I said in the brainstorm, around brainstorming that, think people too many people in the group are starting to think alike somebody has to step away from that to kind of challenge them and she absolutely saw that that to be so so she became like that thought provocateur that innovation mm -hmm. to kind of just to challenge their thinking and she said she wouldn't have thought of that before so i, yeah, I absolutely agree yeah. like I, I totally agree that if students get an inkling of this on how to collaborate more effectively those skills will stay for years and years. And Even how that, to question the questions, because I'm thinking some of, some of the uh, university lecturers I've come across in the past, they set these questions for assignments, uh, and they're, pr they're pretty awful, really. Um, but um, you could question the questions. Yeah, I, 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 That would probably get you into trouble, which is exactly where it got me into trouble at work. But but yeah, being that provocateur is. Uh, I once went on a, a course where they, oh, I suppose you you call it toys. The company manufactured toys, but ex they were ex toys for like executive workshops was what they they were for. So you would yeah. um, people would try and project manage teams to make model cranes to go across the room and this sort of thing. And the woman, was, our project manager, just came came along and said to me, um, "Can you do this?" And I just looked at her and said, "No." And she thought I was being really, really awkward. Then at the end, she she actually came she actually came across and she said, "Actually, I hadn't. It never crossed my mind that somebody would say no. I hadn't even crossed her mind that there was there was more than one possibility, which was wow. quite, which was which was was quite interesting." Yeah, um, yeah, and I, I always I like that, to pr prime people to actually d literally yeah. do do the unexpected in, in workshops sometimes as well, yeah. just to see what happens. Yeah, yeah. I I think you and I have some similarities in our in our style of thinking that we we tend to. I, 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 I think we have. I think we have far too. Stuff. I think we have far too many. Let's word, mention the word jihad a couple of more times. And get ourselves into <laughs> even 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 more trouble. Yeah. So well, actually, bef I think... before I forget, I ought yeah. to, in case anybody is actually actually listening, stroke watching, um, if anybody wants to get in touch with Ed, you can do it there. You can get it. You can visit him on LinkedIn. You can send him a tweet on Twitter. You can look at his website or send him an email. So if you want to learn more about being an innovationalist, terrorist, jihadist, here we go, I got the word jihad in again, um, then that's how you can contact him. And if you miss all that, there will be a replay on, on available on YouTube anyway. So you can get it from there then as well. I thought I'd better put that in, otherwise there would have been no point in asking you about them. Well, that's fine, that's fine. 
I, you know, you, you really now got me thinking about how um, there could be a center. Now, listen, I don't want to use the word in a building, but somewhere that 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 we could pull all this knowledge together. And, and yeah, so it's I don't not, know what that is. It might it's, be. It might even be a cloud. Yeah. Um, it's just things that, that there's so much um, useful knowledge that has been created in this space. The idea that we're starting again with every new generation, that instead of, like they said, that, yeah. that notion about of um, standing on the shoulders of the generation before you, was well, more like we're starting over again and again. Yeah, and I, again. Think, I, think that's the, I think that's the problem. People write new books, they come up with new programs to make money, but it's yeah it's not it's not really furthering the cause yeah and then i think i may have mentioned one too before that that sometimes i've read a few things that suddenly make me realize just how bad we are at this was um i was very interested in the design of meetings and conferences and how we can not just bring people together to learn but if you have all those people in the room that means you have a lot of brain power we should be harnessing that brain power and I thought I was doing all this. I wrote a book on this 15 years ago, thinking I was leading edge. But then I discover a book written in 1945 called Conference Leadership, where it articulates all these processes for people to come together to confer. And I'm thinking, I never even thought of the notion of conferring as being a conference. And yeah. that one book laid out... Um, Years later, open space technology, Owen Harris, Harris, I think his name was, he did, they actually, talk, they didn't have the same language in 45. He talked about that, product development sessions, um, solving conflict yeah. on a team. And they, these were well, devo- well designed, like, and, and the tips and the recommendations, including the chapter that just kind of blew me away was, was why do you have to get women involved with these processes? You know, mm. we would think we may not question that today, but that was so far ahead of the times. Yeah. And there's a whole chapter on perspectives women that are that they can bring to something that's unique. And that's why it's absolutely vital that they're part of these, you know, these conferences to solve issues. So, like I said, yeah. there, there's so much out there. That, there is. That, and I, I don't know how you get that into new minds or starting out on things because in my world um we use books guides tools you know physical things that had lots of words in them and illustrations when that gets transferred online is it used you know i may look up something you know um like some of the work that i did in singapore one of the things that the people just thought these innovation guides i wrote in a couple of innovation guides there they were really high demand because public servants just they were cool and they would and and just that the physical aesthetic aspect of the journals the guides people really like that and they wanted to keep yeah. it and they kept them and they use them for a long time now when things start to go on it's easy but I, I, I hope it leads to actually use to, to, you know, to the use. Yeah, of these I, I think I think you need to touch. You almost need to touch it. I, mean, I can remember when I did my MBA. It was with the Open University Business School, and the, although it was remote learning, the thing we had was every course there was a residential school. So you, so you, 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 you actually, for most subjects, it was basically coming together with people. Yeah. But with the creativity, we you know, oh, we did some some crazy stuff, leaf sculptures, human yeah. human sculptures, that all obviously designed to change the way of thinking. But we but but that showed people that it could actually be useful. Yeah. And I th- I think I I think um yeah, in, in innovation, if it was taught in higher education, should be I don't know what percentage, but but part theoretical where you pick up stuff and part Yep. And part practical, yep. rather than just all theoretical. Yeah. Well, so yeah. The other, just if you're teaching at something, 
this is a distinction that I read that Edward de Bono said. And I just, as soon as, as, soon as I first read this, I just thought, this is brilliant. That he, I'm going to try to paraphrase this because I, I, I won't remember exactly, but he said that one of the problems with the English language is that it doesn't distinguish between like creativity and like artistic creativity, creativity as an idea creativity, the thinking processes, problem yeah. solving. And he said, if we make that distinction, we can then go about learning the skills for both. Like he wasn't against artistic creativity, yeah. but this other one about idea creativity. And as soon as he said that, I thought, yep, I get it. That that there are two very different concepts. Both need to be really creative. Um, yeah. I think if, if you worked at both of those levels, there, there's a lot of crossover in there. Mm. But there's also, you know, to learn how to paint, there's actually a fundamental core skill. Like, I was lousy at it. I couldn't. Yeah. I was really bad as a painter. I can paint still, houses, but not pictures. Yeah. Because there, there is a core skill there, mixing, brush, juice, yeah. all that. It's, it's no different to eight steps for brains or whatever the yeah. technique yeah, actually, you could use that all as metaphors. You have to learn. Um, yeah. you, you, the desire to be creative and paint it must be matched by having basic skills. To, you know, having yeah. Definitely. I mean, we don't look at Rembrandt's lousy first paintings. You just see the end ones. Like every artist must have done a lot of bad work when they first started. Just imagine if you could you could find uh, Leonardo's first picture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it, may not, it might not be impressive, like because all of them had to start somewhere, and, um, you know. And if it's like with these stars, there's there's just only you know, very very few people are like Mozart's of the world who seem to have some gift to yeah. write music. Um, yeah. Most people have to kind of learn, and I, I, there's so many parallels between the two. But I, I mean, I'm all for that that people could learn and explore and kind of pursue what they what that most interests them because societies need creative as in how that could be used in all kinds of different spheres. But we also need this problem solving kind of creativity, idea management, because you know, so much change happens by the you know the, the, the ideas yeah. are like the the, the, the knowledge, the, 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 the it's what creates the value. So I think that's a really interesting idea. I, I just, I, is this for an Elon Musk to set $100 million aside to create some kind of study or someone to create? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, do, I, do, I do think you wouldn't need huge amounts of money. Yeah. You just need to be full-time doing it. Yeah, um, it would be, uh, and it would create a resource. So, fingers crossed. Elon Elon Musk has been listening in. Actually, Elon, if you're there, we won't, we'll take fifty million. We do, we don't we don't need a hundred. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so I, th I think we've just about come to the end of that. We've been talking for ages and ages. Wow, and we could probably go on for ages and ages as well. Yeah. So uh, but anyway. It has been a pleasure. For everybody listening, I hope you've enjoyed as well. Yeah. So um, we'll say goodbye to Ed. Thanks for coming along and uh, hopefully inspire, inspiring some people, educating others, and giving others a kick up the backside. So um, thank All you right. again, Ed. I'm sure I'm sure we will be speaking soon. All right. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate okay, that. Bye-bye. Right. Right, so folks, well, that's another one. Thanks very much to Ed for his uh, contribution. Um, if you have any comments, you can still leave them. And I shall see, well, there will be a replay of this next week, and I shall see you again, hopefully, in a couple of weeks' time. Bye for now.